Today, I want to talk a little bit about generative AI. Now, generative AI has taken the world by storm. We've all heard about chat GPT and all these other models like DALI for image generation and so on, and now even Meta's Llama model. Uh, but I want to talk about um, things that, that go beyond just, you know, here are some cool prompts to use with chat GPT. Um, I really want to talk about what the future holds for this technology. And of course, no one can predict exactly where these things will go. But uh, think about this as sort of my thoughts on a, on a research agenda, on a development agenda that can really take these technologies to the next level. So uh, first of all, generative AI, how does it work, right? So in the case of ChatGPT, uh, one simple example would be, uh, let's take uh, a phrase like, Mary had a little. Like the, most people would complete that phrase by saying, Mary had a little lamb, because that's a really popular kid's uh, nursery rhyme and a lot of people have heard it. Now, because you've heard it, you have a kind of a mental model that can predict the next word when people give you a partial sentence, like Mary had a little, that's a partial sentence, and lamb is the next word. So in the case of these large language models, which is a form of generative AI, things like GPT-3, GPT-4, which power chat GPT, in these models, essentially what's happening is you're predicting the next word. Now, you're not just predicting the next word because before prediction can happen, these large models also do something else, which is that they calculate what are called word embeddings, or in other words, the relationships of words amongst themselves. And they calculate these relationships not on the basis of two or three or four words in a string, but even dozens and hundreds of words. So what that allows them to do is not just focus on the specific word, but the relationships between words. And that allows these models to kind of extract the rules of grammar, the rules of, let's say, propriety, if they've been trained on a data set that reflects that, uh, the rules of semantics, a lot of different things which go beyond just predicting the next word. Now, the other thing that I'll say is that in the case of generative AI, now, when we talk about words, we're talking about something specific. But when you kind of raise this up a level, a word is nothing but a, a token or an element in a sequence, where a sentence defines a sequence and a word might be part of that, might be the next token in that sequence, the next symbol in that sequence. Well, pixels, which are these small dots of color that come together to define an image, they are tokens too. They can be the next thing to predict in a sequence too. And the specificity that you might want to talk about there is the color and the intensity and other properties of that pixel, just like in the case of a word. But it doesn't just stop at pixels and words. These aren't the only things that you can predict as you go along. You can also predict actions. So for example, we might look at, um, let's say, a, a, a baseball pitcher that is about to throw a ball. And just given the curved angle and the ball in his hand, you can generally predict what's going to happen next. That's an action. Now, what's mind-boggling is how much of human activity is really all about just one action to the other and how much of human intelligence uh, in some sense can be encompassed just by being able to understand the relations of actions or tokens or words or pixels amongst themselves and then being able to predict the next one. And being able to do that not just by looking at the immediate last token in the sequence but by looking at lots of context, lots of previous tokens in that sequence. So the reason why generative AI has really um, succeeded and has captured the imagination of so many people is because with these problems solved, like with word embeddings and uh, you being able to communicate the semantics and the, and the grammar and the other uh, properties in language to a model like this, uh, these models have become really good. They, they, they are well-spoken, uh, so to speak. 
Uh, similarly, they can understand style because when you look at, let's say, a painter and you look at the last n pixels, the last n dots of color in a painting, based on those, there's a likelihood that the next thing in that image will look a certain way. And now all of these models capture context. Beyond that context, there's also the fact that because of you know, large-scale computation, because of all of the advancements in GPUs, we can also now train huge models. So that's something you may have heard of when you listen to people talking about uh, these large language models, which is uh, the number of parameters that they've been trained on, billions of parameters now. So these models are really, really large, and they have a lot of context and they can extract patterns in data that we might not even be aware of. In fact, for sure, we're not aware of. So that's why generative AI is succeeding and that's why it's working so well. Now let's talk a, a little bit about some of the criticisms. So for example, with GPT-3 in particular, and the first version of ChatGPT, there was a lot of criticism about the fact that you know, these models just kind of imagine stuff. They're essentially predicting the next word with a statistical likelihood, and therefore they might make things up. They might have been trained on uh, corpora, collections of documents that might contain lies, and these models might parrot those lies, or again, just make things up. Now, in order to deal with things like that, one approach is sort of giving these models some tools to go and check on whether what they're saying is fact or fiction. And an amazing thing that you can do with prompts in these generative models is embed facts as part of the prompt. So one area of work that's happening with generative models is what tools can you equip them with? Can you equip them with the ability to take a prompt, first do a web query on trusted sources, get information back from those sources, and then calculate a response being biased by the true facts that have resulted from that query. So that's one thing that's already being done and that, that people are working on. It also, of course, affords the model live access to information. Uh, the current versions of ChatGPT, for example, are trained on data that ends in 2021. And with these tools, you can actually update that knowledge. But Facts aren't the only um, you know, uh, elements that you can insert into a prompt. You can also equip these systems with tools that can calculate, with tools that can plot, with tools that can speak. And with that, you are essentially giving an LLM mind, if you will, a generative AI mind, the ability to use tools. Now, remember, Tools actually changed human beings. When we discovered tools, for example, fire and the ability to make fire, we were able to cook food. And being able to cook food changed our brains because of the type of nutrition that cooked food delivered to us. So being able to use tools and equipping even a rudimentary intelligence with tools isn't a small thing. It's a huge thing. And when you factor in the constant training and the essentially the loops that go back uh, that allow that network to learn from the outcome or the output of tools, you also have a self-reinforcing intelligence. That's one really intriguing thing to me uh, in terms of future directions for uh, generative AI and for LLMs, which is the use of tools and a wide array of tools. Another element which is really interesting is uh, what I call, you know, the society of mind connection with LLMs. Now, society of mind references a book that Marvin Minsky, one of the progenitors of AI, wrote um, in the 80s, late 70s and 80s. And the idea was that within the brain, there are not one, but many different types of processes. And in some sense, intelligence and awareness are emergent phenomena that result from all these different processes running around and you know, uh, computing whatever they're computing in the brain. The interactions of all these processes are what gives rise to uh, human level intelligent behavior, uh, self-awareness, things of that nature. Now, if you think about LLMs, uh, one of the uh, interesting elements is that you can ask them to play a role. 
Now, this is incredibly interesting because when you ask an LLM to play a role, you're really asking it to simulate something. So LLMs are simulators. For example, you can ask an LLM to act like um, a Unix system and to respond to commands that you would give on the command line of a Unix system and uh, give you output that you would expect from a real system. You can ask an LLM to act like Shakespeare. Big difference, Unix system, Shakespeare, two totally different things, but an LLM can simulate and emulate both of them. So in some sense, LLMs already have these micro models within themselves and they can isolate these micro models and act like Shakespeare or Rumi, a poet, or a machine. And that's really another element which is incredibly compelling and a, and, a, and a great strength of LLMs. So now what happens if you cause LLMs to behave like different processes and you connect them all together, allowing them to talk to each other, a society of mind built using generative AI? That's a really intriguing idea. And in certain applications, uh, you could see the immediate benefits of it where you could, you could ask an LLM to appear as an expert in a certain area and then converse with another LLM that might even be arguing counterpoints or might be acting as a sieve or might be acting as a, um, as a pruner where one AI generates and the other AI checks and prunes and there's a collective decision or a collective output that results from the communication of these society of mind LLMs. And the third and the last bit that I'll mention here uh, is around intrinsic motivation. So in reinforcement learning, there's this idea called intrinsic motivation, which says, what does a system need in order to keep doing what it's doing? What does a system need to pursue a goal? In the case of LLMs, one of the things that's happening is that you are sending in a query, you're asking the LLM or an image generator by providing a prompt to provide you with an output. And then when you get that output, that's about it. It just sits there and waits. And until you ask the next question, until you pose the next query, it will just sit there and wait. It's not intrinsically motivated to do its own thing. It's not going out and trying to find ways in which it can achieve some larger goals other than just responding to your question. So in the case of intrinsic motivation being present in these LLMs, one of the things that could happen is you could have kind of this internal dialogue, uh, a loop, if you will, that continues to ask the LLM questions, takes the outcome, feeds it back in as a question, and seeks to achieve a goal. When this becomes really interesting is when you link up an LLM with the ability to act. And interfacing these LLMs with robots, for example, or any kind of sensor or uh, actuator in the real world is an exciting possibility that allows real world facts, real world experience from the real world to now enter the mind of an LLM. So these are three areas that I'm really excited about. And let's see how LLM innovation continues. I think it's going to be a great couple of years and generative AI is really on a tear.